You are loved by God right where you are, just as I am, and pastors Ingrid and Neely, and all of our parishioners, and every human being. And we can love like God right where we are, as we are called and enabled. That this is one of our greatest gifts of God, and that such is a beautiful thing. Amen. We have some announcements to share. We began a new Bible study, Peace and Anxious World, last Thursday at 11. We still have space for anyone who would like to join for the remaining three weeks. If you would like to participate, you can email glencliffumc at glencliffum at gmail.com. That is g-l-e-n-c-l-i-f-f-u-m at gmail.com. We don't know anyone celebrating their birthday this week. If you or anyone you love is having an upcoming birthday, please add it to the comments below and know that we love you, but God loves you more. Happy birthday to you, cha cha cha. Happy birthday to you, cha cha cha. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. Now, if you will join us in our call to worship, and if you have a candle and a lighter or uh, matches handy, you can light your candle with us. Loving God, here in this place, you welcome all the dreamers as well as all the doubters. Here, the warriors and the wanderers can call you by name. Here in this time, we can remember all the ways that you grace us. Here in these moments, we are reminded that you are with us always. Here we are gathered, daring enough to step out of comfort into the unknown and the uncomfortable. Here in this faith space, we will find the courage to cry out, God save us, and to receive your saving grace in every situation. Amen. Good morning. I'm Pastor Neely, and it's so good to be with you today. Um, prayer is a spiritual exercise. It's a way for us to let go of the things that are joyful or sad on our hearts and put them into the hands of our Creator, knowing that those hands are a lot stronger than ours. So as we get ready to pray this morning, I invite you to just sit back and relax in a way that's most comfortable to you. Put your feet flat on the floor, if possible. Hold your hands, palms up in the receiving mode. Begin to breathe steadily, deeply in. Deeply exhale and get into that rhythm. If you would like to close your eyes, please do so, or you can look at something that brings you peace. Let us pray. We pray for our planet, its healing, its well being, and its renewal, and all of its inhabitants. For citizens of the United States that we may not give in to political or other harmful labels that denigrate our brothers and sisters, but that we will stand with the oppressed with confidence, grace, and mercy of our Lord Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For students, teachers, professors, and school administrators, that they may remain healthy and be inspired in online environments. 
We pray for parents who struggle to help their children in this new age, that they may find support in local community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those living on the streets and outreach workers who help them find housing and supply other needs. For victims of crime and those who perpetrate them. For all living in nursing and rehabilitation homes, including Sanford, Buddy, George, and Jackie. For those experiencing or recovering from health issues, including Smokey, Patty, Neil's brother Mike, Marianne's friend Sonia, Judy, Joanne, and Charlie. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those struggling with addiction of any kind, trauma or negative family situations, for those experiencing loneliness and lack, especially those housebound from COVID quarantine all around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Good morning. As always, it is so good to be with you. I am so excited to be a part of this series featuring pastors from the past, even though it wasn't that long ago, I guess just a couple of months ago that I was hanging out with you guys. But as always, happy to be here, happy to be part of your worship service this morning. Um, so today we are going to take a look at a passage from what I'm sure is becoming one of your favorite books of the Bible. And if it's not your favorite, it's definitely one that you're learning a lot about this summer, and that is the book of Genesis. I feel like you could have, guys have spent a lot of time in Genesis this summer, which is, you know, not a good, bad place to um, spend a lot of time. It's the beginning, and that seems like a pretty good place to start to me. Um, so before we get started, I'll offer a brief prayer, and then I will read our scripture for us, and then we will get to chatting about what this text has to share with us this week. So if you will pray with me. Heavenly God, you are the ultimate giver, the most wonderful lover of our souls, and you are the greatest redeemer the world has ever seen. You are actively making all things new each and every day in big ways and in ways that we could not even think to imagine. You are reconciling us to one another, to ourselves, to others, 
and to the world around us. And it is for all of these things and for so many more that we are eternally grateful. God, we ask that you continue to protect us, to bless us throughout this week, and that you would let the meditations of my heart and the words that I have to share with this congregation today be one of blessing and glorification to you, Lord. It's in the name of our Creator and our Christ and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. All right, so yes, we are in the book of Genesis, and today we find ourselves specifically in Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. So that is Genesis 45, verses 1 through 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. And so there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and your herds and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine is still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. So tell my father about all the honor accorded to me in Egypt and about everything you've seen, and bring my father here quickly. And then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed his brothers and went and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so our story this morning probably sounds like a little bit of a dramatic soap opera, doesn't it? We have this dramatic reveal of Joseph's identity and his subsequent reconciliation with his brothers. And if you've been in church for a while, you probably know a little bit about this story. But in case you need a refresher, here's what has previously happened. Joseph and his brothers that he reunites with in this story are all the sons of Jacob. Now remember, Jacob, we talked about him a few weeks ago. <laughs> Jacob is the one who stole the birthright and the blessing from his brother Esau. So after he'd done all those things, he grew up and he was married a few times actually. And he had a number of sons. And one of those sons is this guy in the story, Joseph. And Jacob loved him so much that he made him a really special robe to signify that he was the favorite child, essentially. And the rest of his brothers were pretty jealous, and they were pretty angry, and they were pretty bitter. And so, one day, they decided that they had had enough of this favorite child nonsense, and they decided to capture Joseph and sell him off to some traveling people into slavery. And they told, their they told their father a lie. They told him that Joseph had been attacked by a wild animal and died. And so that's exactly what they do. They all gang up on Joseph, beat him up, sell him off to these people who are heading to Egypt away from the land that um, Jacob and the other sons all live in. So essentially Joseph would have been essentially good as dead because there was little to no way that these people would have been able to track down Joseph in Egypt except for the fact that God has far better plans for Joseph. So Joseph is sold off into slavery. The sons go home and continue to live their lives. 
In the meantime, God has been protecting Joseph, and he actually gives him the ability to interpret dreams. And over time, Joseph actually becomes pretty good at this, and he be, he's um, pretty useful in Egypt, and he ends up rising to power. In fact, he is essentially granted the position of second in command of all of Egypt. Next to Pharaoh, Joseph is pretty much the top dog in the whole city. And through his ability to interpret dreams, Joseph is also able to predict that there will be a famine in Egypt. And so he's able to help the city store up food and prepare for this famine that's going to come. And then eventually all of the people in all of the lands around the city of Egypt will begin to come to the city to try and buy food. They have to try to survive this famine. When the crops aren't growing, there's no food to be found anywhere. And it's in this moment of need that Joseph has the opportunity to reconnect with his brothers that we read about in this story today. Because they're approaching him, Mr. Second in Command of all of Egypt, and they're asking for help. They're asking if they can buy food from the city to help feed their family back home. And so as we read, you see that they eventually have this moment of real emotional reconciliation and forgiveness. So this is kind of the story that we're living in right now. So taking a step back, we've essentially got these two players, these two groups of characters, these two archetypes of people in this story. We have Joseph, who has made this move from essentially rags to riches, where he had his identity and his family and everything he ever thought and knew kind of stripped away from him when he was sold into slavery, but now has risen into power in the land of Egypt. We also have the brothers of Joseph, who have to live with the secret of what they did to Joseph and have continued to remain where they are, kind of stagnant. They're living uh, with their family as shepherds and farmers, sort of living and working to survive outside of the city. So if you had to play one of these characters, Joseph, or one of the brothers in the story, if you kind of had to take on the role, take on the identity of one of these two characters, which one would you prefer to be? If you're anything like me, I think that I would probably choose Joseph's character because while, yes, he ran into some rough patches early on in the story, he kind of ends up being the hero, doesn't he? I mean, Joseph is the one with power in the story. And if you look at the text, it even says in, in verse 3 that when Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers, they are terrified of him. And I can imagine rightfully so. Not only are they shocked that their brother is actually alive, Joseph is one of the most powerful guys in Egypt, and they're making that connection, right? They're realizing what's happening. Joseph could do anything to his brothers right now. I would bet the brothers were terrified because in this moment, Joseph could use his power to get revenge. What if he decided to sell them into slavery and beat them up just like they did to him all those years ago? Instead, what does Joseph do? He says come close to me and do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for God has brought beauty and life out of the evil things that you've done. Whoa. I mean, that's, that is this incredible flipping of the script that we would expect, right? It's definitely not what the brothers had expected. Joseph is showing them that instead of holding on to the hurt and anger, and bitterness that I'm sure he felt at one point. God has made something beautiful instead. Joseph's brothers, on the other hand, have continued to hold on to the shame and guilt from their actions. They're fearful and hesitant, terrified of what the consequences of their actions might be. And so this dichotomy, this contrasting of these two experiences, this experience of someone doing something wrong, and living in the shame and the fear and the guilt um, and just kind of holding on and hoping that they don't have to deal with the consequences of their actions versus the, <laughs> the recipient of the evil deed being this force of um, forgiveness and <laughs> reconciliation and taking on that pain and saying, I'm, I'm okay, I'm gonna be okay and I'm gonna take this on for you. That, those contrasting experiences actually one of the major themes that you can trace all the way out through the whole book of Genesis. Um, throughout this book, this whole story, we have people who are growing and developing in line with the identity that God has given to them, 
And then we have people who have rejected the identity that God has given to them, and they try to craft their own. So in our story today, Joseph's brothers have rejected their identities as brothers of Joseph by selling him into slavery. They've rejected their identities as family members by continuously lying to their father. They've rejected the identity they have found in truth by lying to themselves that their actions were for some good, right? That they had actually benefited from sending their brother off into the great unknown, into slavery. And then Joseph, on the other hand, has been granted this gift of embracing God's identity for him. I mean, I'm sure it was scary. I can't imagine being sold away by my family and having to navigate surviving in this unfamiliar world. But while he's doing all that, he's come to know the Lord. And it, he's this incredible example of faith because he even has the, I mean, he has the faith to tell his brothers, hey now, God was in control the entire time. And while you intended to harm me, God has intended that for good. So again, I'll ask this question. If you could play one of these characters in the story, who do you think you would choose? And if you're anything like me, I bet you would still choose Joseph, right? <laughs> but if we're honest and we ask the question, who are we actually most like? I would probably say we're more like the brothers, right? It feels easy to lose sight of all that God has for us sometimes. It's easy to forget the identity God is calling us into the identity that is sometimes on the other side of hard, seemingly impossible things. Before COVID, or BC, as I'm sure we could start calling it, we each had a particular identity that had been stripped away from us. Our friends from 61st Avenue had an identity that was taken away from them as their church closed. The original Glencliff folks, you guys have gone through identity changes as the neighborhood of your church has changed the pastors of your churches have changed. There's been some adjustments you've had to make over the years. You might have had an identity that came from an occupation before you retired or were injured and couldn't work. Maybe your identity came from caring for someone who no longer needs you in the same capacity, either a child or an older family member or friend. Maybe your identity came from your social status, your wealth, your looks, or your just ability to wield power. There's a lot of places we can look and we can lean on that. And if we're not careful, those identities can actually pull us away from recognizing our true identity as God has called us. And when we lose what we thought was the foundation of our identity, it can be a really painful and laborious process. And yet, God does not forget us. And God reforms what was intended for harm and turns it into good. So what might things look like on the other side of that process? What might it look like when we get to embrace the new identity that the Lord has given us through all of these changes? It might look like embracing the identity of people who gave up the land that their church was on to build micro homes as a medical respite for friends experiencing homelessness. It might look like the identity of people who are a new iteration of the Methodist church who are a new iteration of the Glencliff family as we merge the two churches of 61st Avenue and Glencliff. It might look like realizing that in the midst of a global pandemic, the only security we have is to rely on Jesus, the one who holds everything together, who is working for your good and God's glory day and night, who knows you better than you even know yourselves and who fiercely loves and protects you and longs to be with you in a fully perfect and reconciled world. We can hold tightly to our former identities and to the hurts of the mindset beforehand, but that will only get us where we've been before. That way of living will only get us so far. This way of living will take us somewhere new and life-giving. So Glencliff family, my word to you this morning is to just keep holding on let us live in the light of the identity set before us by the God of all things. Let us hold fast to hope and to one another as we continue to weather the storm of our current world and all of its trials. Let us rest secure knowing that Jesus is waiting to embrace us, weeping with joy, eager for the reconciliation 
of all things to God's self. Amen. The song we're about to sing is a brand new song by Elias Dummer. It's called God is Good. It reminds us that even when we can't see it or don't even feel like saying it, that God is still working for our good. He's still in our midst. The Holy Spirit guides us and reminds us to be His hands and feet in the world, to work for His good so that we can be more than conquerors through Him. Even in troubled times, God is still good. Let's all remember that. of Glencliff to all surrounding community. You can give through Facebook or by mailing a check to the church building. The next screen will provide details. One of the ways we respond to God's grace is to give ourselves and our materials possessions. When you give to Glencliff UMC, you are investing in love and justice ministries. This can bring joy to all our hearts. Let's pray. Creating God, your boundless miracles in nature are such a small display of awesome deeds. Your visibility enriches all lives with the bounty of the earth's beauty. You abundantly increases these gifts of 
that we may be more faithful stewards of your entire creation. To you be all honor and glory. Amen. the identity given to you by Christ. It is one of great power and true power as given through Christ is then used to empower others. I'm hopeful and I'm excited for all that Glencliffe is doing, shining the light of Christ in the world and in our city of Nashville. Now hear this benediction from Psalm 133. How good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity it is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing and even life forevermore. Now go in peace. Two, 